Thumb out. Good. Okay, shall we start? So, as we're still in my uh, biography for the moment, uh, that's a statue I used to see when I was a kid because I was brought up in Paris, just next to that museum. And so that's why I used it as an emblem for my thesis. And as you see, I point here a, def a first definition between body and behavior analysis. Uh, for me, behavior is something that is calibrated towards an object or that I do to communicate with you. It's, it's a very specific sensory motor psychological combination. While if we do body work, you see this, let's say this behavior, it's a fuzzy one, it doesn't matter, is included in a body structure. For example, a lot of pianists do Alexander t technique work, Matthias Alexander, because they need a good pelvis position and a good back position to be able to do all the funny playing. So behavior is a specific form of virtuosity related to objects and persons, while uh, body is the general structure within which behaviors can unfold. That's the first distinction. Of course, everything can be made more complicated, but let's go into things gradually. Now, I was also talking about this as part of the, the, the thesis I did, and I insisted uh, on that maybe a bit more because of the, what I call empirical studies and scientific studies to differentiate them. Here, what we did is we filmed people of, of, as I told you, of same status or different status. And then we analyzed every image. Uh, an image is five hundredth of a second for 10 minutes. And we coded the position of every single part of the body. So this, this is what I call scientific data, because A, it's direct. There's no interpretation of the data, except that we used a coding system. So, of course, there's a form of reduction, but we're as direct as possible. We're as complete as possible, and we're describing an interactive phenomena completely. And, of course, that sort of method is now, is, was already then actually being used to analyze psychotherapy sessions. That I, I, I take as a beginning of an introduction of what I call a scientific study of what really happens in a psychotherapeutic se session. I'll talk a bit more about that later. So the sort of methods that exist in those days, as you know, the first maybe uh, experimental study I know of is the very famous uh, cigarette scene from Gregory Bateson, which you see here where they, uh, Bateson and his colleagues like uh, Bert Whistle, Kendon, and other specialists of nonverbal behavior. Is that correct? No. No? Can you hear me?
Yes. Is that better? Okay. So warn me when it, when it sort of moves around and is less good, okay? So they analyzed a 10 second moment in psychotherapy, in the, in the psychotherapy session, when Bateson just lit a cigarette. And they worked 15 years understanding all that happens within these 15 seconds. Bird Whistle, in a way, invented nonverbal communication analysis by finding ways of describing not only each gesture, not just he moved his hand, but he moved his hand at that speed, in that way, with that style. And it's from there that a lot of Bateson's contribution to family therapy uh, was born. Uh, another set of uh, studies is, I, I quote this one, Frey. Well, Siegfried Frey was the one I did my thesis with in the end. And, but it is, there's also Valido here, who's uh, doing core therapy now. So you see where several body psychotherapists who do research in a very detailed way. Uh, and I also want to mention this book by Daniel Stern. Uh, Daniel Stern had a lot of, lots of problems in Switzerland uh, because some psychiatrists were trying to prevent him from doing his work on children. In fact, he arrived for personal reasons to Switzerland and then all he could do was teach the difference between schizophrenia and neurosis to students. He couldn't teach all the work he did on, on babies and infants and mothers for inst lousy political institutional reasons. But he, was in, he managed to find some space for thinking. We, we, we did a seminar together in which we could discuss uh, nonverbal research. And he could work with, I don't know if some of you know, uh, Elizabeth Fever's work on uh, getting out of the diet, you know, the, the concept that it's only mother and infant. She would study mother, infant, and father, how they interact. And he made several studies where he, uh, he, where he compared the performance of different psychotherapeutic techniques on uh, helping mothers with their babies. And so there was psychoanalysis, there was behavior, there was cognitive, there was systemic. Okay, maybe those that are furthest away should come closer. Yeah, but I can't solve it. Okay, okay, perfect. Oh, uh, okay. Um, where was, oh yeah, which turn. And what he noticed, uh, he analyzed, he filmed the actual interaction between mothers and infants and therapists. So you had that triad thing from FIVA. And he also tested with the usual empirical methods whether one method was more efficient than the other. But he also tested whether one was more efficient than the other in a specific, in a specific field related to the therapy. For example, you could expect that behavior therapist induced more efficient behavior in the mothers than psychoanalytical approaches. You could also suspect that in behavior therapy you have poor progress at uh, the conceptual level, at the integration level, um, while in psychoanalysis you would have better progress. And he noticed that there was absolutely no difference between the different psychotherapists he observed. That is, and this is confirmed by a lot of what I call scientific research, where you don't care what is the theory of the psychotherapist, you don't care about what the psychotherapist expects, you just see what really happens in a therapeutic session, and what is the real impact of the interaction that happens between the therapist and the patient. And what you observe is that the theories of the psychotherapist are placebo theories. They only help the therapist to have the impression he's being competent. <laughs> they have no predictive value 
of what really happens in the interaction. And what, you do, what, what all these studies, and there are many studies that are still going on now, all that confirm how psychotherapy is useful, how a lot of people feel much better after psychotherapy, regardless of the method, not necessarily regardless of the therapist. Some therapists have ways of doing things they don't even know about themselves, but which has a more constructive or less constructive impact on the patient. So when we're talking of scientific studies of psychotherapy, we're talking of really trying to redefine on scientific terms, independently from whatever schools teach, what is really happening in a psychotherapy session. So uh, that's a smaller party, but it's not body psychotherapy per se, but I think it's important. It's very different from saying, oh, body psychotherapists are more efficient than cognitive therapists for depressive patients. So we're not at all at that level of discussion because we know that, in fact, those studies are arguable for many reasons. I hope not to need to spend too much time on that. So this is the sort of, of yeah, then we did, a, I, 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 for 10 years, 11 years actually, um, I was asked to, to create a, a, a research laboratory in the University Psychiatric Institutions of Geneva by a certain André Enal. You may have heard of him because he published the correspondence between Ferenczi and Freud and things like that. And he asked me to use the coding system of Ekman and Friesen, of facial analysis, uh, to see if we could de detect the suicidal risk of patients. That is, we had people arriving at a hospital because they made a suicide attempt. Then we would film the interview between the doctor in the hospital and that patient. And then we waited for about four years and we, we made one group of those that had made a, uh, a suicide attempt in those days, uh, since then, and those that hadn't. So we had re-attempters and just attempters, one who did one known attempt. And we tried to see if there were difference on the face. So if we use Ekman and Friesen's emotional coding, we found no difference between the two groups. That is, it, the differences we observed, but they had nothing to do with emotions. We had to go and look, scan for other things. What we, we did observe, here we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, just 12 patients. It's a small group. And the unit where we, we've done here is we lumped together all forms of movements of the lips. You know, all those things. I don't know if those far away can see, but just move around your lips. And I call, that, I call those oral movements. The characteristic of those oral movements is that they are recurrent, randomly recurrent, have no apparent meaning, certainly do not correspond to Ekman and Friesen's emotional coding. And uh, uh, are more frequent. The, in, in, in the re-attempter group here, you see that they're more frequent than here. But they exist in both, so you can't just say uh, if there's a signal once, you know, like in, in Lowen's thing, if you're like this, you're that, and if you're not like this, you're not that. Here, uh, in both groups, you have people doing it. So you can't say there's suicidal risk if I see one oral movement. Uh, on the other hand, if the oral movements become more and more continuous, more and more frequent, you can start suspecting suicide attempt uh, risk. And if you notice, here is a big exception, and here is another big exception. So it's very important to say that with body science in psychotherapy in general, you should never say, you're closed because you're like that. You know, some people have done that in body psychotherapy. Uh, 
You should say, oh, you've got crossed arms. How do you experience that? And maybe I've got crossed arms because I'm cold. There's nothing to do, you know, there was a time when people would say, if you're closed, like in PNL, they, they use it a lot, you know, you're resisting the therapist. So the more we study nonverbal communication, the more we see that there's no sign that has one meaning or one function. Uh, oops, sorry, I, went to, I haven't left that yet. Um, then uh, a colleague of ours, uh, Milena Abiati, she took more cases than those we, we found. And if you take more cases comparing attempters and reattempters, you get statistically significant results on that variable. And since then, I've used it. And again, I never used it as a diagnosis. But as, oh my god, are we going to need to worry about suicide or not with that person? And it has always worked. You see also that oral activity a lot with uh, uh, people who suffer from bulimia and from uh, other uh, eating disorders. And when I discussed that with uh, Marc Archinard, who was uh, working with eating disorders in our team, uh, he told me, but you know, a lot of them have suicidal uh, 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 need, uh, I mean, uh, thoughts. So there, there might be a relevance to that. And then uh, the, the, the most popular part of that research, when it's quoted, for example, by Beatrice Beebe, is that not only could we distinguish about 80% of the patients with suicidal risk, but we could do that looking at the therapist. So here is an example. What we're looking at is the tendency to look away from the patient. Well, if you see in the whole number here, the results, the tendency is low. You know, if you're doing a filmed interview, uh, you tend to look at your patient. And actually, it's a form of politeness in such situations. And we, we compared two, two topics. One was a topic where we just asked, do you think you will attempt suicide again? Given the situation, this is a banal question. As you know, we also have a lot of theory on uh, repressed anger and suicide. So at the end of the interview, uh, the doctor would ask the patient, uh, did you appreciate the, tr the way you were treated here in the hospital? There, I suspected hidden anger would be more often activated. And indeed, what you see here is that whether you are a reattempter or an attempter, the looking away behavior is close to equivalent. There was no difference in the therapist. At least the therapist didn't expect anything. And so she didn't look at the patient for 4% of the time, which is her uh, you know, current behavior. But there she knew she was taking more risk because as you know, she's the doctor and if the hospital didn't do good work uh, with a patient, uh, she's being personally attacked. And suddenly you see that only with attempters, she doesn't dare not to look at them. There she has nearly a bit less, but here it's nearly impossible. She doesn't dare not to look at the patient. So if you take signs like that, and there are several others on the doctor, you see that something in her uh, which has, hadn't reached her consciousness, because she, we asked her, of course, with tests, and you know, what do you expect from your patient? Do you think he'll do suicide or not, and so on. That was random. That, that you know, her conscious evaluation was, was not interesting. But her nonverbal behavior told us that something in her uh, had reacted to something in the patient which could be a pretty good predictor of suicide risk. So there again we see that the body has, or behavior, you can argue whether it's the body or behavior, has, uh, has, has participates in the communication system. Uh, for a moment the doctor you know, felt a lot of anxiety when we showed her those results because she says, was I the cause of the suicides? And we told her that it has nothing to do with it. But uh, you know, you start saying, are there behaviors which are more or less uh, 
strengthening or weakening the pathology of the patient. And we can look at those films with therapists and show them what was, you know, constructive, what was not constructive. Are you hearing me or not? Okay. Okay. So that, that, was, uh, that was what I did as an academic uh, psychologist. Now I pass to the other part, which is that uh, when I was working in, in, in the 20s, you know, uh, I was a psychologist of my day. That means that as soon as I began psychology, I began a psychoanalysis, because that's what you did in those days. And because we were in the 60s, well, the Beatles all went to transcendental meditation. So I went to transcendental meditation uh, and did meditation. And I was doing theater, I was doing Tai Chi. I was very involved in, I think be, mostly because of theater, in combining uh, uh, but my, my experience, my, my self-exploration with the body. And after a while, my psychoanalyst told me, you're no good for psychoanalysis. Uh, you're, you're, you know, you're just a student saying I do a psychoanalysis because one has to. I can't work with such a motivation. Uh, but given your interest, you might go and there's a bioenergetics group in Lausanne and Geneva. You might go and try that and that might be more useful for you. So I did a bit of that. And they weren't very good uh, therapists, but I was interested by what was happening. So several members of that group says, well, maybe we could find uh, somebody who's uh, a bit better for body psychotherapy. I was also getting involved reading Reich and things like that with a lot of interest. And one of us went to London because in those days, everything was happening in London and went to see Bodella, Gerda Boyce, and Malcolm Brown, a whole set of people. And finally, the person who accepted to come to Geneva to teach was Gerda Boyson. So I didn't go to Gerda Boyson's training because I thought she was the best body psychotherapist in the world, but because she was the only good body psychotherapist who was willing to go to Geneva. Uh, my main focus was Reich and whether she could teach me to understand how Reich worked. But anyway, uh, I discovered through her that there wasn't only London, there was also Oslo as a big center of uh, body psychotherapy. And actually, even today, Oslo is the one country in the world where body psychotherapists work in hospitals for all pathologies, heart disease, uh, uh, bulimia, not just in psychiatry. And they're integrated there since the 1940s since Otto Finichel mostly and Reich uh, were in Oslo during the war. And she's, she's uh, Gerda Boysen, uh, that's me and her, when I was specializing in a method they call deep draining, which is very deep mus muscular massage which tries to realign the posture. Uh, and uh, she, she was herself a mix. She wasn't always aware of what she was a mix of because she didn't have much uh, interest for the history of psychotherapy. But she was obviously influenced by, indirectly, by Finichel, Reich, Jung, Freud, and actually alchemy, uh, spirituality, anything that, that uh, fascinated her. So I went to her because I found Piaget's talk on emotions completely boring, inefficient. It didn't interest him. He had, he had made a psychoanalysis for six months with Sabina Spielrein, who had become a psychoanalyst and was in Geneva for a while. And she, she told him to stop, like my psychoanalyst told me to stop, because all he would do during his psychoanalysis is criticize Freud and his theory. So he didn't really speak about himself and, is it okay? Okay. So I trained for her for several years and her team. And of course I discovered uh, this realm of literature. Um, what was interesting for me, so on one side I was with Piaget learning highly rigorous experimental psychology. And people say, how can you stand being with that uh, esoteric, 
uh, Bombay and Gerda Boysen, how do you, are you completely split? And uh, I said, no, what I'm discovering is a psychologist. She was a psychologist. And what she kept from, from her training in psychology was that she always had very precise models for whatever she did. That model was not scientific, but it was clinically very precise. Every time I did that massage, I would have a precise metaphor of why I was doing that massage to that person at that moment, and what I would hope to discover doing that massage. And she was very clear, she wasn't a fanatic. She would say, if you use a method and it doesn't fit the patient, forget the method and try another one. She actually told us a thing which for me is very precious, is you have to have many tools in your pocket, and you never know which one will be the right one for that patient at that moment. So she was against putting patients in a sort of mill, like a bit in bioenergetics in those days with Lowen. You did your grounding, you did your thing on his back, uh, you did your thing like that. Uh, it was fairly standardized. And then you had that uh, character analysis he imposed to people, which for me was an insult system. You know, When I have a friend who has wide shoulders and small feet, and he's called a psychopath, which is literally what uh, Lowen does publicly. So he asks you to come on, on the stage, and he calls you a psychopath. And I, you know, he was a friend. He wasn't uh, torturing children or you know, calling a psychopath. Some, uh, any one of you, just because you have wide shoulders, is for me an insult system. And for Gerda, she just says, oh, all those males, they, they need to, be, to use hyper-rigid uh, uh, models. Uh, we females don't need to, to have those uh, rigid references. Anyway, that's the sort of education I got uh, at that time in body psychotherapy. Uh, oh yeah, you want me to be like that and to look like that, okay. Yeah, this, so, so what happened with us psychologists who were doing body psychotherapists? George Downing is somebody of my generation. We, we all, uh, explore those methods, but we all remain psychologists also. That is, how could we shape this knowledge without losing it? How could we, uh, because the experiences we had on ourselves doing that work were incredibly powerful. Uh, I lived really ecstatic moments, uh, much more ecstatic than in my psychoanalysis. And I thought that it was interesting that you could use methods and make, them exper and make people experience those things in a fairly predictable way. Uh, and our prob and, but those people, like, like Gerda Boysen, or, uh, they, they didn't care about being respectable. They didn't care about being recognized. They, they just were doing the things as they wanted to do them. And I think a, a central thing nobody talks about was the generation during the Second World War. During the Second World War, if you remember, professional ethics and professional knowledge was heavily controlled by strong ideologies like Nazism and communism. So people, uh, a lot of people, for example, in the French resistance, they were people who thought there was a deeper ethical motivation than just following the official legal system, the official laws. Uh, in Switzerland, uh, some people have been punished by law because they saved Jews during the war. And it's only since 10 years that they've been rehabilitated. rehabilitated. So there was a strong inner ethics developed by many Europeans to fight against official ethics. And I think in the body psychotherapy of Gerda Boysen's generation, uh, this was a strong motivation. You don't follow official ethics because it can be dangerous, because it can be inhuman. And the whole humanistic uh, movement during the 70s uh, followed that tradition too. Remember, uh, Convendit would say in 68 in Paris that uh, that we're trying to lose the system that created two world wars. The system being the ethics uh, and the morality 
which fucked up generations and led them to horrible wars, horrible political systems. So in that generation, you had people who really, uh, as, you, as I told you, they don't care about being recognized. They care about doing something they believe in the way they believe it. But of course, for us in my generation, uh, Nazism wasn't there anymore. Communism was dying, even at the, in those days. Uh, and we had more respect uh, towards official psychology. For example, me in Switzerland, with Piaget, ethically, uh, I was very comfortable. I mean, he was a wonderful guy, a wonderful kindness. Uh, so I didn't have the mistrust that generation had. So a lot of people in my generation tried to reintegrate body psychotherapy into psychology and reanalyze what we were learning from people like Gerda Boyson, Alexander Lowe, and uh, Reichens, and so on, using the, the glasses of a psychologist. And I think that, that's a good summary of part of my life. So for me, it wasn't at all schizophrenic to jump from Piaget to Gerda Boyson. Okay. Uh, two seconds breathing time before I go into next chapter. Yeah, we have another, what? Until the exercise, we have half an hour. Is that it? Twenty minutes, fine. So what, now I'm going to talk uh, of something even more personal than I did right now, but still I think is relevant to our presentation today, is the difficulties I had as a psychologist to be a body psychotherapist. So you see, I had those two antagonist figures. One is Reich, who died in prison for his ideas. And the other one is the kind, lovely, child-caring, famous, genius Piaget. And I can tell you the Piagetians, when I talked to Reich, they didn't like it. When I talked of meditation and yoga, they didn't like it. I had people coming to me, inviting me for lunch, and says, look, Michael, you're a good student. We don't want to lose you. But if you go on talking of Reich and and body therapy and, and yoga, you're never going to make a career. You're just suiciding yourself. And I met one of those professors recently because he was a friend of my father's and he came to the burial of my father. And then my father's wife said, well, let's have lunch with Michael. Uh, I mean, I had been his pupil once. And he came to my home and we had a nice lunch. And he, uh, I said, remember when you invited me for lunch telling me that it would be suicidal for my career uh, if I became a body psychotherapist. And he looked at me and says, well, I was right, wasn't I? In a way, it's true. I might have had a more brilliant academic career if I hadn't been such officially a Russian. Even when I was working in the psychiatric institutions, my boss would say, but Michael, we know you're Russian, but you don't have to put it in all the time. You, you've got other things to say which are more interesting. So at the, origin, at, 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 the, at the beginning of my studies, being a body psychotherapist was just plain forbidden. And as I told you, people like Gerda Boyston and so on didn't care a hoot about what psychologists were thinking of her. She had enough work anyway. Oh, OK. I think it moves a bit. And is it good now? Oops. When you mean when I talk like this or like that? It's better like this? <laughs> it's better like that? OK. Uh, so recently, as you know, the, the relations between body psychotherapy and academia has changed. Otherwise, I wouldn't be here to start with. And I give you two examples. 
One, of course, is that today talking of mindfulness in psychological uh, circles is highly respectable. Uh, a good example is this book on yoga uh, with the preface of, uh, of uh, Van der Kolk, which shows in a quite respectably, I mean, it's often quoted book, that's why I put it here. Um, but in the 1990s, uh, 80s, when I was in psychiatry, I had a, a problem with uh, this book. This book was published by Guimon, who was one of the uh, professors of psychiatry in those days. And he did an international congress on, uh, on the body in psychotherapy. Notice the nuance, it's a very important one. It's not body psychotherapy. Actually, he was using the Julia Guerra technique I was telling you about, where you're a psychoanalyst who sometimes uses relaxation techniques. And in this Congress, it was quite schizophrenic for me. I was, given the fact that I was directing a lab in the institution on suicidal studies, I was on the panel of the scientific uh, a battle of those who could show that doing, including the body in psychotherapy was scientifically important. I was there as a pure scientist who had never done body psychotherapy in his life, who had to give scientific evidence showing that the body could be useful. In the same Congress, there was Jerome Lees, who's a, I don't know if you know him, but he was a pretty famous body psychotherapist. He was in a very small room at the uh, two floors under the the ground floor, uh, given a sort of hidden presentation of body psychotherapy. <laughs> and not at one moment did I have the space to talk of the fact that somehow I also work with the body in psychotherapy. Actually, I was, even, I, was even I was not even presented as a psychotherapist. I was just a scientist uh, doing experimental work. So that was the situation. Uh, still in the 1980s. Okay. Uh, we have how much time? 14 minutes. 14, 14 steps. Okay, good. So, uh, uh, today, on the other hand, today, uh, it's now 10 years, I, in the same faculty, bizarrely, it's very strange for me, in the same faculty, I was asked to give first-year psychology students a course, which I, give, I gave for 10 years, I think I'm gonna stop it, on uh, breathing to work with stress. Oh. Oh, well, that's afterwards. Uh, breathing to work on stress. And there, of course, uh, I was even encouraged to become more Russian. I just took Sale's classical model of how uh, hormones and brain and so on interact. And first, I just showed certain breathing techniques which are used in, you know, even by the police today when you have car accidents. Uh, but um, they encouraged me to show work on uh, the orgastic reflex to first year students and I had to show them how the whole breathing and movements work together. Uh, I introduced uh, Gerda Boyson's work on the startle reflex, on fears that get stuck in your body. And more and more during that course, I noticed I could even ask patients, I mean uh, students, to explore some body movements in the university, uh, to make small groups and discuss about their emotions. So quite clearly, uh, at, at the same side, us body psychotherapists, because I have the two us's in this case, uh, are also developing ways of presenting our work, which is more and more compatible with academic standards. So that today I think is a good moment to think that we could start uh, uh, thinking about how to re reinvent body psychotherapy in such a way that the practice university split doesn't exist anymore. Uh, body psychotherapists have fought for, since the 1930s basically, against the body-mind split. It's time we also envisage that 
the body-mind split is also the the science uh, the science body split. I remember once the EABP in the 90s did uh, a congress called uh, Love and Science. The implicit, not what, the, what I managed to take out of the title, initially it was meant to be Love or Science. And I was asked to speak for science uh, and try to see if science could maybe bridge a gap that existed between science and love. And I showed them that actually love is in science since it exists. When Galileo fought against the Inquisition, he wasn't exactly fighting for hate. But even for body psychotherapists, it was very difficult to accept that science is not hate. And there again, the Second World War and McCarthyism and so on was partially responsible for that, uh, for that split. Um, what I'm going to do in, in the, after the exercise we're doing now, we're going to do now, is show you that for me there's a long tradition in psychology, which, which is called organismic psychology on Wikipedia, so I'm not inventing it. This is a Wikipedia list, in which we can include what body psychotherapists are doing. They didn't come out of the blue. They didn't uh, emerge of no thinking before them. You know, Reich presents himself as, I discovered a new continent, like Christopher Columbus. But quite obviously, uh, uh, the whole movement of body psychotherapy emerged from a, a very big movement that was uh, spreading throughout scientific and philosophical thinking in Europe and in the United States, joining, integrating, uh, methods that were already existing in the rest of the world, like trance work, tai chi, meditation, and so on. And so after our exercise, we'll go into that, if that is okay for you. And now as, as a, a next, ex, next exercise, I haven't got slides for that. Um, I want to introduce you something about Reichen work. Uh, the organomy period, the worst period, when he was a criminal. And he was working on this impossible orgone theory, which everybody sort of tries to distance itself from today. And one of the things which clinically remained for me as highly important is his concept of pulsation. And we can all do that together to start with, but that's how Eva Reich taught it to me. You just rub your hands. Actually, I also learned that doing Chinese massage. So it's not only Reich, it's a quite universal exercise, but you really have to rub it, rub it, rub it, rub it, rub it, rub it, rub it. And then you feel the static energy behind your hands, in between your hands, I mean. And for some people, you might notice there's a, st a slight movement going in pulsation. I know it doesn't work with everyone, but for some people, so the question is, what is the static energy? I'm against theories and for facts. That there is a field between your hands, most of you can feel it. For Reich, it was cosmic energy. For materialists, it's uh, static energy. And for others, it's a different sort of whatever you want. But the idea is that for some, t for some people, this energy has a slight pulsation. I don't know if some of you can feel that or not. Lift up your hands, those that have felt it. So you see, it's, it's, uh, that's more or less what I expected in percentage. It's not everybody, but it's not nobody or just one or two people. Uh, if you're a pure Raishan, uh, he would say, those of you who are blocked didn't feel it, and those of you who are not blocked felt it. That's a pure Raishan. I'm, I don't agree with that way of thinking. Uh, it's just that uh, maybe his theory is wrong. Uh, but this is what we call pulsation. And what I'm going to ask you to do is to do two things. One is a pulsation exercise. Uh, you can spread yourself 
in the room to have space to do it. And the pulsation exercise, you can either do it in a, in a Tai Chi way, which is, you know, uh, grounding yourself and just experiencing how it is to pulsate slowly. And to do that for 10 minutes, okay? You can do it sitting, but again, sitting like for the meditation uh, with the correct pelvic position. And then I will ask you to form groups. Uh, we have, we have uh, half an hour, yeah. So after 10 minutes, I, I would like you to redo the same or different small groups and explore a second dimension of that exercise. I use it for psychotherapy as a metaphor. That is, you can't be open to others and open to yourself at the same moment. That's the first rule I work on, for example, in couple therapy. Second rule is, the nice thing about the movement is the transition phase. It's not just being like that with others or like that with myself. It's how do I pass from the one to the other? It's just like in the breathing, the apneas are very short. The whole interesting part of the breathing is that slow in-breath and that slow out-breath. So discussing about not being able to be with oneself and with the other at the same moment is important. You have to create different moments for that. But also, how do I pass from one to the other? Because if you just shut the door uh, to your husband or wife and say, I need to be alone and do a relaxation exercise, you're not, hap you're not helping the family dynamics. Or it's the moment I do my meditation, children, please shut up. You know, The transition periods are not worked on correctly, which means that the whole point of being completely with the other like an orgasm or completely with oneself like in meditation is that the transition periods allow you, A, to readjust your physiological system to different forms of experience, but also to include those moments in the general dynamics of the group of people you're working with. So there are two levels. This is where we go into body psychotherapy. We're not just doing relaxative pulsation, which is a very important thing. It's very useful for many people. But we're also using pulsation as a metaphor to understand how we interact with other people. So that's what I propose we do for the next uh, 30 minutes. So please uh, uh, prepare yourself in the room to do pulsation. It's very good. Uh, yeah, does that I like it? Yeah. yeah.